FOMO. Hey, FOMO sapiens. I am going to be taking it easy today because it's New Year's Eve. So I wanted to reach into the vault back to season one. Season one was a different time on FOMO sapiens. Let me tell you something about season one. I used to actually record the shows on video. You can find them on YouTube and they are, um, they, we didn't do any editing. We just sim- simply recorded from the top to the bottom. And I read from a script and a teleprompter and our sound wasn't so awesome, but I don't care about any of that because this guest is amazing, Jacob Fain. Jacob Fain was working at Sony in Sony Music Publishing, working with talent. Now he's moved on to a big, big job at the head of A&R, that's Artists and Representation, at Electra Records, which is you know one of the big titans in the industry. So I got this email from him telling me about his new job, and I, and I responded with this very pithy phrase, what's it like to be a legend? Because this guy is a legend. The way he thinks about data and the music industry is completely groundbreaking. No wonder he's done so well. And I think it's a great episode for anybody who loves music. And by the way, all of us, we've, I mean, for me anyway, and I'm sure for you, music has been so instrumental to not going crazy this year. Also, it's a great way to think about how to integrate data in non-obvious places and how to think about that. So I think he's just a fascinating guy. So many people have told me they love this episode. And I also want you to appreciate, (laughs) at least I, I hope you'll appreciate how far we've come on FOMO Sapiens in terms of the way we do the show when we put it together. And of course, we are always happy to hear your recommendations, but this one, it's old school. I think it was number 16 and we're now up into the seventies and eighties. So a long time ago, two years ago, a different world, different time, but I was still a FOMO sapiens then, and I will be one next year. And I hope you will be here with me in 2021 until then have a happy new year. FOMO. My name is Patrick McGinnis and I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic and it's changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show about finding the power to choose what you actually want in business and life and the courage to miss out on everything else. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, the creator of the term FOMO, and I'm coming at you from AW360 Studios in the global capital of FOMO, New York City. Once upon a time, people would dedicate precious real estate in their homes to a little something called a record collection. But with the passage of time, this became a cassette tape collection, then a CD collection, and today you store music on your hard drive or in the cloud. Nowadays, people who own records are usually hipsters who put a few around their living room as decoration or a sign of how cool they are. No matter how you consume music, however, it's always worth thinking about the people who discover and cultivate the artists who create the hits that we know and love. People who work in A&R, and that's short for artists and repertoire, scour the earth looking for the next new thing. But just like any of us, they're human, and they are not immune to FOMO when signing new talent. If you've ever wondered how they manage to make these kinds of decisions in a world filled with FOMO, then you're going to love today's show. Jacob Fain is the Senior Vice President of A&R and Head of Global Analytics and Research at Sony ATV Music Publishing, based in New York. He signed such artists as the Chainsmokers of Monsters and Men, Leon Bridges, Russ, Passion Pit, Chase Rice, Parson James, and the Congos. He is also responsibility for the incorporation of data into the signing and development process of artists and writers. Welcome, Jacob. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you here. So I like to start with the same question every time, which is, what is giving you FOMO right now? I would say that not even right now what gives us FOMO and gives me FOMO every day is wanting to make sure you don't miss the next big thing. In the music industry, you know, we have the privilege of working with other people's art and talent Mm -hmm. and you always want to get the new and exciting one, but obviously so does your competition and you don't want to miss it out. Okay. That's, I think, every day. This is what we're going to dive into today. Yeah. So take me, take me kind of into the essence of the industry. So, you know, this isn't, when I think about the record industry, I mean, we've all seen the movies yep. uh, about, you know, like the, the, in the 1960s, you know, the person who discovered some talent on a street corner or whatever it was. But, a little bit more dramatic than in real life, but definitely. <laughs> how does it really work? What is the role of AR, A&R traditionally? And, and, you know, how has it always kind of been? Right. I mean, uh, you know, A&R guys at record companies and publishing companies are the ones who are entrusted with helping identify 
the acts that you want to bring on and not just the identifying, but actually courting them, making sure they understand an artist's vision for what they want to be, bringing them on board. And then most importantly, when they're uh, signed to the company, when they're here, executing on behalf of the artist to fulfill that vision. And so it was really the A&R guys that were out there looking and hustling. And we received a lot of demos and CDs and tapes. And you'd sort through them and you'd listen to them. And, you know, if you heard something that was special and really moved you and you thought was going to change the world and be impactful, then let's go, man. Let's rock and roll. Let's get going. Let's sign it. And so in a place like New York, I imagine you're out at like the clubs, trying to hear the artists who maybe haven't broken yet and trying to yeah. find people before they become the the subject of everybody's FOMO and bidding. Oh yeah, when I started, like I knew the doormen and the bouncers at, and the bartenders at every club in the Lower East Side, at the Mercury Lounge, at Bowery Ballroom. Oh man, it, like you know, uh, literally every club around New York, the Knitting Factory, when it's still in Manhattan, that was what you did. It was a lot of that. And did you find anybody in some of the artists that you know you've worked with in the past? Did, did any of them come out of those like club dates that you just showed up with like seven people there? Same process, but not actually from a live show. But yeah, I, we've definitely signed things that you didn't know anything about. You just heard something, and then it was wow! Like so, there, there's something really magical and special about that. This is someone I really want to, I want to work with. So maybe if I start singing for you right now, there's a chance <laughs> that I can turn this. <laughs> there into. is, and we have a guy from our finance department out there, so he can cut you the check. This All is right. like perfect. Perfect. <laughs> um, okay, so that was the way it was before. That was like in 70s through. Let's just to you know for ease two thousand early two thousands that was basically what it was. Okay, and then things changed. So what what's going on today, and how have things changed? Change, I I would say they've changed, but it's things have been added. So okay. gut always should and thank God does drive the music business. We work in a in an ethereal, artistic, soul driven, passionate. A business where people are spilling out, you know, their emotions into music, and so you always need to have gut leading that and heart in the, in the music guiding decision making. In addition to that, basically, there's now a, a lot of data out there, and what we've been able to do is identify that by looking at that data, in addition to using gut, we can make more informed and better decisions, and the, that's done to help the artist and help our songwriters and help the business grow, which is good for everybody. And we now have almost like a second layer to the decision-making process. And that's, you know, that's kind of where the business is growing into. And so these days, it's it's not that there's no gut at all. It's not that you you hear, I mean, I'm trying to think of, I, I, all the examples I want to give are so cheesy. Like, <laughs> you hear the next Carly Rae Jepsen. I'm clear. There's I'm no saying. cheesy, man. Like, no matter what the song, there, there's always passion behind it. Okay. Even though it may not, you know, I don't love every song in the world, right? Okay. Nobody does. But there there's always someone who likes something, which but, is the beauty of music. So you hear that you're you're at the, you somebody drops you a demo or, you know, somebody who you trust comes along and says, listen to this person. And you listen right. to them and you, you have the gut feeling it's there. Sure. You've added on top this analytical layer that allows you to make a better decision. Correct. Absolutely. And can it tell you no? Could you have somebody who everybody feels around the table like, oh, we love this person. They're awesome. But we just you, there's nothing to support them. Or do you think the gut still can sort of overwin the data? There's never a no, because every artist deserves a shot, even if it's music that you may not really understand. But, you know, who's to judge what is valid, valid in, in, the, uh, in the art world and, you know, whether it be music or anything? You know, what it can, you know, help us do is say, you know, we think that what's reasonable and healthy for the company is one thing. And this is what we're going to try to do to make sure that we're not just losing and losing in money because... If that happens, then there's no company. So there's not a, we're not able to help our writers. And there's also a lot of people whose livelihood depends on that who don't have jobs if, you know, any, if we're hemorrhaging money. Right. Yeah, it's, it's really about trying to do what's best for the writers as well and the, and the artists because, you know, doing a bad deal for an artist or a songwriter is really bad for them, disadvantageous to them. Nobody wins when you're stuck in some contract that you're indebted to, that you can't get out of, and you're, you know, you should be in a position of power and, uh, and influence at, at, all, at all times. Now, one thing that's interesting is you mentioned the, there's music publishing, 
which is where you are t- today. And then there's like the record companies, which is a different thing. You've done that as well. Yeah. What's the, for the lay person out there, yeah, that, that, getting, a, what's the difference? Good question. About half the business doesn't know the difference. So don't worry, it's not the lay person. <laughs> I feel better. Uh, so the master side, that's a record company. So the actual recording. Yeah. So for example, the Beatles recordings, uh, those masters are owned by a record company. The copyrights, the actual songs themselves, are owned by a different company. That's the music publishing company that deals with the songwriting rights. There's only one master from the Beatles of Let It Be. But you can go on iTunes and buy a hundred different versions of that song. Each different version is a new master, but it's still the same copyright. And that's essentially what music publishing is about. That song versus that master recording. So, that's the okay. difference. So the, 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 when you hear a cover, that's the music publisher coming Correct. in. Correct. That's the song. It. It's a different person recording that song, yeah. but it's the same composition. Composition is a great word, right? That sounds kind of nerdy a little bit and right. a little more studious, but like that, it, it's what it is. It's a composition. And you mentioned if, if part of the, what the data does is allows you to keep from putting people into bad deals. Like what would a bad deal be in the in this industry? I mean, you don't wanna be in a, a contract with anything, whether no matter anyone where you can't get out of it. Yeah. That's like really bad for the creative process. You wanna be able to have fluidity and power of negotiation. And we win when writers and artists win. And yeah. so making sure that our writers and artists are not in deals that they're stuck, that is a, you know, that's good for everybody. Yeah. So one thing, as I think about this, you know, we were talking about the gut, gut is always important. And if you see and want to break talent, even if maybe you don't have the data to back them up, you will go ahead anyway, because you, you're making a bet on, it's like being a venture capitalist, right? hundred percent on this like startup. Sure. It is. Yeah. On the flip side, I can imagine if you have, say you have an artist who's breaking or, you know, starting to get some name and then everybody's trying to sign this person and the offers are getting really stupid and people are offering crazy stuff. I imagine that's where the analytics can be especially helpful in saying, does it make sense to bid like a crazy amount for this person? Yeah. I mean, that there is a component of that, but you, you, every, you know, everything has a creative, you know, component to it. And you have to take risks to sign things. Yeah. I mean, to, you know, to, to build off what you said and twist it a little bit, mm. there's often times where we can, you know, give bands everything they want and then some because we're like, oh my God, this is huge and it's amazing. And guess what? Every, all, everything supports it. Like, hell yeah, man. Let's, I don't know if I can say hell, you but like, <laughs> family friendly show, just no F bombs. But like, let's go, man. Let's rock. I mean, cause we're, and we're so focused around like just like giving an artist money, but like that's so, that's really important. But the, the real part is about, a, you know, an artistic partnership. And one of the things that, you know, analytics can do in addition to gut is help us, tr- you know, help turn us on to things that we might not have had the foresight. You know, we're at the end of the day, and our department is just a collection of, you know, 20 people. You can't really expect all 20 people to be perfect. It was human error is natural, let alone with such a small group compared to the world consuming music globally. So you can use data to help us see things that we may not be seeing. Hey, man, we really like we're missing this. Like, come on, this guy's amazing. Holy wow, you're right. How we were not paying attention to this. Let's rock. And then like, there's a, that's what it's about. Cool. You know, and people like to focus on the money and that's natural. And we like, and, as you said, it's New York, it's a business minded city, but it, it drives a lot of, you know, it, it opens doors and shines a light into a lot of areas that are, you know, unexplored. So without giving us all your secrets, all your traits. Yeah, I secrets. can't or else remember who's out there is going <laughs> to knock me over the head in the middle of this. <laughs> exactly. Well, the door will open. The and door will open. It's just a, a mask. I'm yanked and we're done. <laughs> but... Um, what is the, what, so what is the data that you're looking at when you're doing your analytics? Like what are those inputs and how do you get them? Yeah. I mean, without being too detailed, I mean, essentially like it's pretty straightforward. And and this is, you know, the, the genius of it is that it's actually not that complex. Mm -hmm. What we're really doing is just watching what the business is doing, watching what the, not the business, watching what the marketplace is doing and observing it. That's it. We just, we sit there and watch and we see what the public wants. We see what music consumers are asking for and we try to service that and give them that and see where the trends are heading. That's it. You know, we, and to do that, we monitor everything you would expect, right? How do music consumers interact with music through streaming platforms? through single buying, through tickets, through, you know, social media in some, in, in some cases. So we're observers. 
it's not complex. And that's the thing. It's, you know, who are we to tell the world what they will like? Yeah. Better to sit back and see what everyone's raising their hands for. And there's a lot of surprises you get. You know, there's a lot of really wonderful music. You're like, man, I would never expected that to work. And it's so good. That's rad. Let's like develop this and grow this and help build this wonderful musical moment. And it, that, that's like some of the most rewarding work you can expect. Do you ever look back and say, or you look at the trends and say, okay, interesting. Like in the last three months, we've had massive sales of like 80s, like um, pop or, you know, something or some niche thing, like a country. Right. Um, the country and, you know, it's all of a sudden young people are buying country music. Should we try to find artists who do that? Does that happen or is that? You is get that... sounds and okay. you know, you, is what it is. Like in, you mentioned the 80s right before we started rolling. You were telling me you, you know, you saw a band St. Lucia who we have the, you know, the privilege of working with you. I think you know, he's fantastic, but you hear sounds start to creep up. Yeah. So you'll, you know, you'll get, you know, something will start to pop up and you're like, wow, man, that's like a really 80s throwback synthy vibe. Like, that's killer. Like, I wouldn't have expected that sound to be popular. And then like the next week, boop, there's like another thing. And then, and then it's like all of a sudden you see sounds that are, you know, out there anyway. And just that's where the taste of the market is starting to turn. Yeah. And so these new acts and new songs are just beginning to creep up. And yeah, you, you definitely see that. Absolutely. Tastes are constantly evolving and merging too. A hundred percent. And then when you do these models or these analytical kind of exercises, is it like, I, I kind of think of this, um, this is my like science fiction analysis of like, if I went to your office that there's this computer and then I press like yeah. the calculate <laughs> button and then it gives like a number, it's like 32. Yeah, big 10 page document. It's yeah. like 32, no. <laughs> you should sign these three people. Like, how do you actually use the data? Yeah, there? no, I mean, and that's like, right. I've like, people have come in and be like, hey, where's the red button, man? <laughs> Where's the curtain? Uh, yeah, no. Look, we have a, a team of analysts that you know that work with us in a in a you know variety of capacities. And as I said before, you know what we really are using that to do, or using that for, is to make sure that we're aware of things that we should be aware of, mm. uh, and and you know understanding where the markets are going and what the trends are, so that we can just be conscious of that. We've all signed things that are countercurrent to that, and you know that's. You got to do that too. So there's no printout that's like, sign these things, they're big. Okay. Because that's not what it's about. Like you need to understand like the artistry of it and the music of it and the quality of the songwriting. But you want to do that while still being aware of what's going on. It's like the weather, right? You may not wear a raincoat every day, but you at least want to know if it's going to rain. Yeah. And if you're like me and you have like an obnoxious golf umbrella, you never wear a raincoat because you're basically in like a tent. So it's your like. <laughs> That's New York. Go. And then it, yeah. It's, I'm it's that guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. With under the guy. scaffolding, knocking it yeah, and like, yeah. People. Yeah. I'm real. It's not as fun to be around me on the rain. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, um, do you, and it's raining today. It um, is pouring. Do you, how does social media play into all of this? You know, you want to be aware of it. Um, mm -hmm. You definitely want to know what's happening uh, w with an artist's socials. Uh, and again, you know, if it's there, because, you know, we're, we sign things that are just songs. We sign artists that have nothing. It's like, here are some demos, and you're like, whoa, what is this? Like, this is a, like Leon Bridges. I thank God his manager, who's a really close friend of mine, walked into my office and just handed me demos and was like, no socials. And wow. I was like, blown away. Uh, but that's rare. You, you want to watch them. Pretty obvious Instagram and Twitter and Facebook are the three kind of main players. And it's just, it's another data point. You just want to be aware of it. Like the weather, if you choose to act on it, that's up to you, but you want to be aware of it. How about if somebody has a massive social following, like say tomorrow, um, Selena, well, Selena Gomez already has a music She career, does credit music. Actually, I, it's pretty, I, I'm a fan, but. Sure, know, why not? It's um, awesome. But you have a, a, so you have an artist who has a major following. Like, say Kim Kardashian decides to become a singer. Okay. And she's not particularly good, but, you know, she comes to you, she wants to sign with you. You know you have the analytics, but, like, the music isn't there. How do you think about that? I mean, is that yeah. something palatable or? Yeah, look, no decision, as I said before, decisions are neither all data or all uh, got, you know, th there's an overlap and a different degree of the ingredients in every decision. And by the way, there has been since the beginning of this business, people who think that when they were sitting at the Mercury Lounge and watching a band perform in, you know, deciding if they were going to want to sign it, that's data. They're looking mm -hmm. at who's singing the songs, how many people are in the crowd, are people into it or not. They're just... It's a different data point than you may, you know, be used to. When you think of data, you think of like a number, but yeah. it's still data. And f for situations like that, uh, you know, you have to evaluate it like anything else. 
do I vibe with this project? Do I think that there's real longevity to it? Do I think that most importantly, and this, if there's a takeaway from this entire discussion, which has ironically nothing to do with FOMO, but the songs are the most important thing. Yeah. I take it back here. There's the most FOMO in the music business relating to songs because no one wants to pass on a song that they think could be a hit, but there's always a debate whether or not you want to take it. But uh, the songs are the determining factor. It's a lot like publishing. Publishing is this mix of art and data, but what really at the end of the day matters is the ideas. So if you could sure. have a great author, but if the, the concept is crap, like a lot of people won't touch it. Yeah, that's and you see that a lot. Like there's some amazing artists that just haven't broken out as big as they could because the songs aren't there yet. Yeah. Yeah. There's FOMO, man. It's like, oh man, I really want to cut this record, but I don't know. Like this could be the song, and I don't know if I should take this record or this record. And I, oh yeah, dude, I, there is a ton of FOMO in that. That's, that is. Uh, oh, oh that's, yeah. That, see, you're that's, really, a, that's, that's the, the FOMO sapiens. That is the political. And by the way, that is the political game of the century mm. on negotiating for songs. It gets really complicated. Tell me something. How does streaming affect all of this? Streaming has been, as I'm sure anyone who's watching this has an interest in the music industry knows, a real boom for this business. Mm -hmm. It has taken us out of that 2000 or you know, early 2000s slump and really given birth to the, you know, the next wave of, of growth. So it's, it's pretty impactful and it drives a lot of the data because most of consumption is now all streaming. Do they give so, it to you? Can you get the data if you call these guys? It is a pretty complicated uh, dynamic. We're ha the biggest issue the data uh, users have right now is access to data. And the real challenge we have is getting it. I think that Spotify and Apple and Pandora and Shazam and everyone realized a, a real boon for them was in this enormous you know, trove of data they didn't think was really going to be worth much. And then as the business moves into, you know, contemporary music companies are all data focused. And so they recognize they have an asset that all these companies are really going to want. So getting that has become quite complicated. I can imagine some of them are thinking, I have all this data. Why don't I use it to start breaking artists? Or start getting paid. Yeah. Yeah. That's both. And, and, and. Both. Yeah, yeah, look at, you know, Spotify is trying to do direct deals with artists. I mean, yeah, sure. Absolutely. We can foresee who's going to be successful, who's young and up and coming and unsigned on our platform. We can see it faster than anybody else because sure. it's our information. Let's call them. Let's call everybody underneath, just underneath a specific threshold and do direct deals with all of them. But I would imagine sure. you would agree with me if I were to say... That's fine. You can sign an artist, but if you don't have the system behind them, if you don't have the support to develop the talent, you could create a lot of one-hit wonders. But creating artists with sort of duration and, and careers is much harder. Yeah, I agree with that totally. I, you know, and there's you know one-hit wonders happen, and that you know there's there's a spark there. It's up to you know the the team around an artist and the artist to to really cultivate that spark and turn it into into something more. But it is certainly like a real long-term career, that is the hardest thing there is. Right. Totally. Yeah, I just remember, like, I, I, this was probably 15 years ago now, there was a cover of Umbrella as a, as a ballad. Do you remember that? I do. She was great. Yeah. And I can't remember her name, but that was song was huge. Everyone that song's to amazing. It. And that I think, demo was like a one listen. Like, that demo was like... Phew. Yeah, exactly. And then, but you've never heard her name again. And it's sort of like, because all the other parts of the system weren't there to sustain that. Yeah. Okay. No, that I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think music companies in, in, in a lot of forms are still around. Like, I mean, it really does take an army. Yeah. I mean, breaking as an artist is one of the most difficult things to do. Yet another reason why data is so important, because data drives so much of the marketing efforts, because you need to be calculated, because it's so hard, man. Like, you can have that spark, which is what everybody dreams of, right? The hit, the, the moment, and it can still not happen, Yeah, which happens a lot. Like, there's so many Wasn't songs sure that are is. like... <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's so many songs. You're like, oh my God, we're moving, we're moving, we're moving. Nope, didn't make it. That's brutal, heartbreaking. Yeah. It's very tough. So knowing all of this and the fact that you know there is this data overlay that the industry is changing, that all these things are happening. If you kind of were giving advice to a young artist, which I'm sure you do all the time, by the way, people probably call you all the time and say like, my daughter is really good singer. I'm sure, <laughs> yeah. right? Or like, There's a lot my of that. son's such a my good singer. My aunt sends a lot of people my way. Yeah, good, no, nice. that's all good. So, like, what is the advice that you would give to a young person who wants to, given the knowledge of sure. the dynamics, to, to use them to their advantage? I would say that, and this is so true, and it's so good too, because thank God we're in this situation. All of the tools to break are now squarely in an artist's hands. Thank God. Mm. The barriers to entry into the music marketplace are finally broken down. 
thank God. I mean, an artist can reach all of his or her fans without the need of a record company, a publishing company, anything, because artists are younger and they've grown up using the tools that fans use to consume music, Instagram, Facebook, streaming, everything. And they know how to talk to their fans and they know the value of transparency and of creating a culture around their artist persona and how the music can become an extension of that. Yeah. The worst thing you can do, I believe, for whatever it's worth, in the beginning is to rush to immediately sign a deal. Go out there and start doing it yourself. Wait until all the labels and everyone are knocking on your door and then look at doing a deal. You don't need anybody until they're breaking down your front door to work with you. It's so true. It's <clears> just <throat> like venture capital where 100%. you meet a startup yeah. founder and they're, they're looking to raise the money day one. And it's sort of like, why don't you wait until you have traction and you have leverage to actually sign a deal that makes sense for you rather than being a price taker and taking whatever they offer you? Yeah. No, it's a, there are a lot of parallels in that. Oh, That's correct. So industry changing. Um, what do you think we're going to be in, you know, in 10 years? Will there be record album labels? Will they be, what, what, what do you think is coming down? Yeah. I, th I mean, honestly, I think there's gonna be two meaningful changes. I think that, you know, is in building on what I was saying before, which is a really good thing. The more, the power dynamic is going to continue to shift in favor of artists, which is really good. Mm. Record contracts were predominantly favoring only, I hate to say this, this might come back to bite me. They were definitely favoring record companies, not artists like that. That's, well, that's, I'm, I'm, that, that's I'm not sorry. They, like, right. Like the royalty split was ridiculous right. and artists were like, they were loss leaders. Like I'm not gonna make money on my records, but I'm gonna make money on the road. The deal structures for, for masters, for records are, are becoming much more fair and artists are more empowered. That's anytime an artist is empowered to drive the process, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And then second, I, I think we're moving away from albums. You know, if you look at the way the record is uh, approached, like albums are no longer entirely composed of new music. It's a lot of songs that have already been released and a few new ones because people want regular release of content. There's about 30,000 new songs released a week. And in order to stay in front of people's minds, you need to be continually continuing to put out music. It's so it's so true. When I go to iTunes, I'll buy a track of this person or that person because I heard it on TV or I heard it in the radio or what I don't listen to the radio, but I heard it somewhere in a restaurant. And I shazammed it. The only time I've seen people buy that you see the albums, you know, really breaking is when it's a soundtrack. Right. Yeah, then soundtracks like, can be right. Hamilton was huge. Right? Yeah, of course. You know, the greatest showman. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot. <laughs> and those are, you always see them at the top or whatever. But yeah, otherwise it's it is an artist are starting to create that way, and it's starting to become. And there's what's up. And this is kind of a non sequitur, but I want to uh, since I have you, it's like, bring it on, let's man. Answer Patrick's. We're questions. here, man. Yeah. I'm in. I hope that the listeners want to know this as well. <laughs> what is up? Like it's all collaborations now. Like there's a lot of collaborating. So like yeah. Is that financially smart for the artist? Like, is it just that it- Sure, if it ends up being a song that's a hit, absolutely. Sure. Better than not having a hit. Do they all have writing credits on it usually? Uh, it dep everything's circumstantial. Okay. Generally, yeah, right? I mean, it depends. You know, people who are kind of coming into a song and just cutting a vocal might still get a piece of the publishing and the writing and, you know, just maybe not as big, but it's great. I mean, think of all of the great new sounds and blending of genres that have come from people working together more. Yeah. You know, that's more of empowering the artist. Let the, let artists be artists. The the worst thing we can do is over involve ourselves in an artist process. We are there to support the artists, and they're the ones that are driving this. And look at how successful it is. It's great. It's yeah. really good for the business. No, it's very it's very true. And I think it, you're right. It's a great way for artists to go across. Genre. Like if you think about yeah. the middle, the, the, that song, the Z. Song. Sure, everyone loves that. Yeah, well, I, it's my. I mean, you know, I love that song. It's a good song. And they but brought in that. The, the there's country, a New York Times singer, Marin something. Marin like Morris. Yeah, so she's a country singer. Like sure. she would have never been with Zed, and now, you know, that works so well for her. Now she yeah. can do totally new things with it. Totally. Florida Georgia Line had a great class. Look, Sam Smith and Calvin Harris. Yeah. Right. Those are two worlds you may not have thought could could work together. And oh, absolutely. To your life is so much cooler than mine. It's like ridiculous. <laughs> That's the greatest misconception. People think that the music, I mean, look, I, I, I'm very fortunate. I, I love working in music, but people, there, there is a real misconception. People think that it is just an, an all day party. Uh, that is very much not true. This is a growing industry and that means there's responsibility to that. And as I said before, we have the privilege of working with other people's art. Mm. We're entrusted to do that. There's a real set of, you know, that, that weighs on you. you there's responsibility to that. You know, we get to go home at night and that's it. It's not our life that's out there in the front of everybody. Yeah. It's not our songwriting that's out there in front of everybody. So, you know, you can't, you take that seriously. 
No, it's, it's a very, it's something we forget, I think, as listeners, is we think, you think of the poet or the struggling actor as being, you know, sort of so right. exposed, but it's true that even the most successful artists that we can think of are, these are people who are creators and they're not, <clears throat> we, they may have lots of people behind them helping them, but at the end of the day, they're putting themselves out there. Oh yeah, especially now when in the world of social media where everyone sees everything you do and everyone's judging you and it's so easy to pass judgment and comment on that. I mean, it can be the, the best and worst thing to start seeing what people think of you on the internet because it can it can lead to the pretty uh, you know dramatic emotional swings. I know it's, it's brutal. I had, I had a troll on Amazon yeah. <laughs> who trolled my book, and seriously, this guy or lady, I think it was a guy though. I made a speech and and the person didn't like something I said. I said something political, which by the way, I'll never do. Yeah, again. don't do that. That's never bad be news. political there you unless go. you like you really want to get trolled. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I got a one star review that I'm a terrible person. Yeah. And I'm, there you go. That I grew up with a silver spoon in my mouth. It's like oh. let me invite you to my hometown in Maine and show you that yeah. the case. But it was I, I you know in my own little baby way I sort of got to understand like when you see artists for example who put themselves out there and maybe do things that are unpopular like the sure. Dixie Chicks did during. The you know when they were sort of protesting the war and stuff and people sure. hated them. Yeah, it's insane. And doing something that's right and countercurrent to what may be popular at the moment that can invite some serious backlash online too. Yeah. So um, so this has been super interesting. Thank sure. You so much. Absolutely appreciate so, having. So me. our listeners now, everybody. I mean, you said your life's not that cool, but um, <laughs> but <laughs> it's cool for other reasons that you know I feel fortunate to work in music, but it's cool for other reasons. So there we go. So if, if people want to find out more about you or follow you, where's the best place they can find you? Instagram and Twitter are always the easiest. Uh, it's just at Jake Fain for both, and uh, you know also exploring Sony ATV. We, you know, very happy to be uh, with such a great publishing company. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's good no, to see you, man. Pleasure. All right. So um, I don't know about you, but now I'm going to listen to music a little differently than I did before. Um, and now I want to transition to our faux moment of the week. So this week I was reading an article on Cult of Mac about this hot new feature on the iPhone that is giving people FOMO. And it's this thing that integrates with your watch, your Apple watch, and allows you to talk as if you're on a walkie talkie. But unfortunately, all of these people who have this new Apple Watch and are supposedly able to use this feature can't enjoy it because you need to find somebody who has the exact updated version of the watch to use it. So you have all these people who bought this new watch and sadly for them, they have tons of FOMO. But I have a news uh, flash for all of you people who have bought this watch. You may have FOMO, but you also haven't gotten punched in the face yet because when you start talking on your watch all day like it's a walkie-talkie, you're probably going to alienate all the people around you. So for a little longer, we can live in a world without people talking at their watches like they're Dick Tracy. FOMO. Big news. We now have a brand new website. So head over to FOMOSapiens.com where you can listen to past episodes, learn more about the show, and find out how to advertise. Also, head over to Spotify where you can find and follow playlists of the best of the show. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you, so don't be shy. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstrow. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMOSapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO. FOMO.